All right, uh, thanks very much. Um, and thank you to the organizers, uh, to Michael, to Maya, to Kevin, and to Alma for bringing us here. And thank you, Akshay, for devoting your Fields Medal Symposium to such an interesting topic. All right, uh, so today my hope is to interest you in the possibility of using this moment to revisit our foundation system with the aim of bringing the foundations a little bit closer to mathematical intuition and then as a side effect, that would make uh, mathematics potentially easier to formalize. Um, I did not come to this view from a background in logic or foundations or computer science. Um, like a, many working mathematicians, when I earned my PhD, I could not have correctly stated all the axioms of ZFC. Um, uh, however, since that time, I've completely changed my perspective on what it means to do mathematics, what constitutes a mathematical proof. And uh, I found this to be fascinating, so I'd like to share some of that with you as well. Great, so I was apologizing to the live audience. I have a lot I want to say. This will go a little bit quickly, but the slides are available right now if you want them. And if somebody could type that link into the chat, that would be wonderful. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. So uh, if you're teaching an introduction to proofs course to undergraduates or an undergraduate logic course, one of your tasks is to explain uh, the precise mathematical meaning of the quantifiers or the or the connectives like and and or, to, since it's a bit different than the way they're used colloquially. And the traditional way to do this uses truth tables. So uh, you could use uh, the letters P and Q to stand in for arbitrary propositions that are true and false. And then there's a table that explains the truth value of expression P and Q or P and Q in terms of the truth values of P and Q individually. Um, the problem with this is it's mind numbingly boring. <laughs> and it also is a little bit beside the point, which is to teach undergraduates how to analyze the logical structure of a statement and then use that to guide their proof writing. Um, so I don't teach truth tables anymore. Instead, I've switched to this wonderful textbook by Clive Newstead, An Infinite Descent into Pure Mathematics, which introduces conjunction and disjunction in the following way. So conjunction is a logical operator defined by the rules that are displayed here. Okay, so a few things to notice. The, firstly, the rules are divided into what are called introduction rules and what are called elimination rules. So the introduction rules explain the strategy that is needed to prove a theorem that involves a particular connective, whereas an elimination rule explains how you could use a hypothesis involving a particular connective to prove something else. What I like about these rules is they translate very naturally into proof strategies. So in particular, if you look at the elimination rule for or, it's giving the strategy of a proof by cases. It says that if a statement P or Q is true, and if R can be derived, that you know, the truth of R can be derived from either P and from Q, then R is true. So this is the argument by cases strategy. So I find this a much more intuitive way uh, to explain what and and or really mean, how they function within mathematics. So here are the rules that characterize implication. It's the logical operator defined by the following rules. Again, there's an introduction rule, which would explain how you would prove an implication, and an elimination rule, which explains how you would use an implication. So the introduction rule says is if you can you know, make a logical argument that derives Q from P, then what you've proven is P implies Q. Uh, for the elimination rule in this case, if you know that P implies Q is true, and you know that P is true, then Q is true. Okay, and uh, what I really want to emphasize is the practicality of having uh, the logical connectives introduced by rules like this. So an exercise, you might ask students to prove for arbitrary propositions P, Q, and R, uh, the following tautology of sentential logic. So P and Q, P implies Q and Q implies R implies P implies R. This is just always true. And uh, these rules will guide our strategy in writing the proof. So the first is, uh, so by the, if we look at the outermost connective in the statement we're trying to prove, it's an implication. So we use the introduction rule for implications. That's the one that gives us a strategy for proving an implication. And so by this introduction rule, we get to assume uh, the antecedent and we want to prove the consequence. We assume that P and Q, imp P implies Q and Q implies R is true. And our new goal is now to prove P implies R. So at each step in the proof, the assumptions are changing and the goals are changing. This was visualized above the line and below the line in the two proof assistant demonstrations, the one we saw this morning from Tim and the one we saw yesterday from Johan. Um, I'm also optimistic about the use of proof assistance in helping students who are learning to follow these logical steps for the first time to stay organized in their proof so they know exactly where they are. Okay, so our goal is still to prove a P implies R. So by the 
Introduction rule for implication, again, that uh, helps us prove P implies R. We can assume also that P is true, and now our new goal is just to prove R. So now our assumptions are P and this P implies Q and Q implies R. By the elimination rule for and, once we have a hypothesis that P implies Q and Q implies R is true, we have separately that P implies Q is true and Q implies R is true. And now by the elimination rule for implication, we can use the truth of P and the truth of P implies Q to conclude the truth of Q and then the truth of Q and Q implies R to conclude the truth of R. So um, this takes a little bit of practice if you're not used to it, but I think it is uh, relatively low to the ground and become quite intuitive. Okay, so I mean a thing that certainly confuses students who are learning to prove theorems for the first time is how to use quantifiers correctly, both in statements and in proofs. And uh, so they can be introduced similarly by rules like this. So what the quantifier binds is uh, a family of propositions or predicate. So uh, X here is a set. P is some function that to each uh, element of the set associates a truth value. Um, so an example is if X is the set of natural numbers, the predicate could be the statement that N is prime. For certain N, this is true. For other N, this is false. Um, so then the sentence that's universal quantification for all X and X, P of X is true. It's the logical formula defined by the following rules. And we really saw these animated very nicely this morning in, in Tim's talk. Uh, so the introduction rule uh, says that if you can prove that P holds for an arbitrary element X of X, then for all X, P and X is true. The elimination rule says that if you have this universally quantified statement, and then you also have a particular element A of X, you can conclude that P of A is true. Um, and uh, similarly for existential quantification, if you have an element of a of a of x and p of a is true, then there exists x and x p of x is true. And uh, if we have uh, an existential statement and you can derive something else q from uh, an assumption that p of a is true for some a and x, then q is just true in, in general. Um, and again, we we saw these. We were proving yesterday in the demonstration that for all uh, natural numbers n, there exists a natural number p so that p is prime and p is greater than n and the first strategy so the the statement the outermost connective is a for all so by this introduction rule we gave ourselves an n or you could call it k you can name the variable whatever you want now our statement is an existential thing there exists some p so uh, by the introduction rule for the existence we supplied a particular p n factorial plus one and then we updated our goal so so once more these rules are really guiding students into the strategies that we use to prove these sorts of statements. Okay, so uh, if you like these sorts of rules to explain logic, uh, you might also like dependent type theory. So the dependent type theory is this alternative formal system, or really it's the core part of this alternative formal system that I'm so excited about. Uh, and uh, it has the following notions as primitive. So this, this should be compared with the traditional foundation sort of set theory on top of first order logic. So the, the primitives in uh, type theory are called types. Uh, so things like the natural numbers, the rational numbers, there's a type of groups. So types can have sort of higher structures than just sets as we'll see. There's also a primitive notion of term and each term belongs to a specified type. So the 17 that is a natural number is different from the 17 that is a real number, but there is a term in each type for those things. Uh, in the type of groups, we have the klein four group, for instance. And then the name dependent type theory comes from the fact that we also have dependent types and dependent terms. So this is not the standard syntax for these. I'll address that momentarily. But um, a, a way to think about a dependent type is that's like a family of types parameterized by a variable and a pre-existing type. So for any natural number n, I have the Euclidean space r to the n. So in when I'm given a natural number n, I have r to the n. So there's a family of types for each n, I have a type r to the n of n-dimensional real vectors. Uh, these families of types are, can be naturally regarded as a, a generalization of the predicates. So there's this dependent type is prime that uh, for each natural number n is the type that corresponds to the truth value of the statement, uh, n is prime. Um, that can be constructed in various ways that I'd be happy to discuss. And uh, families of types can depend on multiple parameters as well. So given an n and an m, I have the type of m by n matrices. Um, 
if I had more room on that line, I would have also introduced a type of rings. So given an N and an M and a ring of coefficients, there's the type of N by M matrices with coefficients in R. Um, so this is sort of very uh, natural in mathematics. And then we have dependent terms that in, inhabit these dependent type families. So in side so n-dimensional Euclidean space for any n, we have the zero vector, for instance. Uh, in, uh, as an n by n matrix, we always have the identity matrix. Uh, for any n, uh, there's a symmetric group of that order. So Sn is a term of type group for any natural number n. And again, this is not the usual syntax. These are introduced in. What I'm suppressing is something that's very important, but I think it will be confusing, and so I won't hardly mention it again, is that all of this can occur in an arbitrary context of variables from previously defined types. So when I was learning this for the first time, context seemed entirely unfamiliar, but they're present in everyday mathematical speech. So if you say something like, uh, you know, for any natural number n and for any group of order n, then uh, that group can be realized as a subgroup of some symmetric group. Um, so when I, at the start of the sentence, this let be, the stuff following let is declaring the names of variables that belong in a context. So here I had n, a natural number, g, a group of a specified order. Um, and then the after the then, so the after the then I said uh, g can be realized as a subgroup of a symmetric group. What I've said there actually is the name of a type. So this would be the type of uh, subgroups of symmetric groups. And uh, I've, so I've, in the statement of the theorem, I've given the context and then a type in that context. And then to prove that theorem, I would uh, you know, use Cayley's construction to instantiate my group as a subgroup of a particular symmetric group, for instance. OK, great. So what animates uh, dependent type theory, again, we have these, um, sorry. Uh, we have these primitive notions of types and terms. Um, what brings them into life, like what brings sets into life, are the, the rules they satisfy. Or we say rules instead of axioms here. And they'll look very familiar because they very naturally extend the rules for the logical connectives, and an or in this case, to a setting where types might carry data in addition to truth values. So the introduction rule for and said that if A is true and B is true, then A and B is true. But the introduction rule for the product type says is that I'm given a term, little a of type A, and a term, little b of type B, then I have a term in the product type. I've introduced it with notation that will make it seem familiar, but the rule is really just that given an a, a little a and a little b, I have a term in the product type. Um, if uh, we think of a type as something that encodes data that witnesses the truth to a proposition, then this uh, rule indicates a correspondence between the product types and, and conjunction. So to inhabit a product type, I have to inhabit the components separately, just like to prove an and I have to prove the sub propositions uh, independently. And there's an elim elimination rule just the same that projects out from a term of a product type to terms of the constituent types. I've introduce those terms with some notation to make the operation seem familiar, but the rule is really just that given a term, there is another term. And then there's a relationship between these introduction and elimination rules uh, um, in the form of computation rules, and that's another layer of the type theory that I'm going to suppress entirely, but is um, very important, particularly to the computer scientists. Um, Co-product type uh, similarly is uh, analogous uh, to the conjunction, or sorry, disjunction operation. So what I'd like to compare now is the experience of defining functions in set theory. I mean, this is another very annoying part in an intro to proofs course, is you have to explain what a function is. And the way that mathematicians think about functions, the intuition is entirely separate um, in many instances from the formal definition. So in set theory, everything is encoded as a set. So the function is encoded as the subset of the product of the domain and the codomain corresponding to the graph, which is expressed via this logical formula. But this really is not how we think about functions, particularly with regards to composition. You know, nobody's thinking, oh, you just form the pullback, and then that defines the composite. Um, but by contrast, the function type, so these are how functions are defined in type theory, uh, satisfies, in my view, sort of very natural rules that are exactly analogous to the rules for implication that we saw previously. So what do these rules say? So firstly, Given any types A and B, there is a function type. So here in red, that's the name of a single type uh, that I will read as A implies B, the type of functions from A to B. 
Uh, so the introduction rule is what supplies a term in a function type, so what will construct a function for us. And the way to read it is if by um, some sequence combining a whole bunch of rules of type theory, I can use an arbitrary term of type A to produce a term of type B, then I'm entitled to package that into a function that in mathematical notation I would write as x maps to b of x, but the traditional computer science notation uses this lambda abstraction. So lambda x dot b of x is syntax in CS for the function x maps to b of x. Um, but anyway, if there's an algorithm or procedure to take an arbitrary x and produce a term of type b, then you package that into a function. The elimination rule says that if I have a term of a function type, so this f here is a term of the function type and also a term of its domain, then I get a term of its codomain, which I've uh, denoted using the usual evaluation notation. And again, there are computation rules here that I'm suppressing. Okay, and then what corresponds to the universal and existential quantifiers in dependent type theory are these things called dependent function types and dependent sum types. So remember the thing that we quantified was a predicate. So that was a function P from some set into the set of truth values. Uh, here we're considering instead a family of types over, I'm sorry, that's a typo. It's a family of types over a type A. So this B, you can think of as a function that takes a term little x of type A and produces a type. Um, this could be a, a constant type family, perhaps, or it could be a varying type family. Both are permissible. So um, given such a thing, this dependent function type is governed by the following rules. So the introduction rule, that's the one that's going to give us a term in this dependent function type, says that, again, if uh, in the context of a variable or variable term of type a, you can you know, apply the rules of type theory and produce a term of type, uh, sorry, that's a mistake as well, that should be b, a little b of x is in type b of x, then I have a term in this dependent function type. And the elimination rule says that if I have a term in a dependent function type and a term of type a, then I get a term of type b of a. So uh, there's a very close relationship between uh, dependent function types and function types. Indeed, uh, function types are the special case of dependent function types where the codomain is constant. Um, and the dependent sum type is then governed by the rules that's, uh, there's a pairing rule. So if I have a term A of type A and then a term B in the fiber over that term of type A, so B has to belong to B of A, then these pair together uh, to define a term the dependent sum type and uh, once more there's an elimination rule that's a little confusing when you see it for the first time that explains how to use such terms how to map out of such terms. Okay, so one of my favorite uh, comparisons, I guess, between set theory and type theory is when we think about the natural numbers so. Um, in set theory, uh, I mean when, when we're formalizing mathematics when we're encoding mathematics formally within set theory everything is a set there's there's no sets in elephants everything is a set uh, the element relation is a binary relation on sets so sets are elements of other sets so the natural numbers is a set but to construct it we need to define its elements which are also sets and there are two uh, historically important constructions uh, due to von Neumann and Zermelo so for both of them they uh, identify the number zero with the empty set and then the number one with the set containing the empty set. And then von Neumann identifies the number two with the set that contains the empty set and also the set that contains the empty set. And so then the number three, which is what I've written here, is the set with three elements, the empty set, the set containing the empty set, and the set containing the empty set, and the set containing the empty set. <laughs> so Zermelo, <laughs> otherwise known as zero, one, and two, of course, of course. But, uh, I'm trying to make a point, you know. So Zermelo, on the other hand, and the point is that I can use my parentheses correctly, you know. So uh, for Zermelo, three is a singleton set that contains uh, the set containing the set containing the empty set, as written there. And then the natural numbers is, of course, the set of all of these sets. So, that, so three is just one of the many elements, of course. So this leads to a natural question. Uh, is three an element of 17? So, I mean, I, I didn't ask this as came from this paper, but, um, I mean, on the one hand, this is nonsense, but on the other hand, it's, it's a totally legitimate question uh, in the language of set theory. Is this, 
you know, 3 is a set, 17 is a set, it makes sense for one set to be an element of another set, because that's how elements work in set theory, and uh, so is this an element of 17? So what's bad about this question is, firstly, it's uh, nonsense and confusing, um, and also it has a different answer depending on how you define 3 and how you define 17. So for the von Neumann construction, the answer is yes, and for the Zermelo construction, the answer is no. So, um, I mean, of course, this is not how mathematicians think about the natural numbers at all. Uh, instead, uh, we think about the piano postulates, and there's a theorem, I think, originally due to Dedekind that says that the natural numbers are, are uniquely characterized as isomorphism as a set together with an element zero and a successor function that satisfies the following axioms. So the zero is not a successor, successor function is injective, and then the principle of mathematical induction. So this is uh, maybe a more structuralist perspective on what the natural numbers are, but of course it's not how the natural numbers are actually constructed in the formal system. Um, and um, yeah, so now to explain what the natural numbers are in type theory. So, um, so they're governed by the following rules. So one of the rules is just that, you know, we're assuming the existence of a type of natural numbers. Uh, the introduction rule, this is the one that supplies terms in the natural number type. Uh, there are two introduction rules. One says that there is a term zero, and the second says that uh, if I have a term n, there is also a term which is the successor of n. So the introduction rules supply the zero and the successor function. And then the elimination rule is precisely analogous to the principle of mathematical induction, except I replaced the predicate in the principle of mathematical induction by a family of types. So let's uh, go back and see that real quick. So in the principle of mathematical induction, uh, it says for all p predicates on the natural numbers, so that's like the statement is prime or, or sorry n is prime or n is odd or n squared plus n is even. You, these are statements that have one free variable which is a natural number and then are either true or false. So the principle of mathematical induction is a strategy for proving a universally quantified statement for all n and n, uh, p of n holds. And it says you have to check two different cases. You have to prove firstly that p of zero holds, and then you have to prove for an arbitrary k that p of k implies p of the successor of k. And from that information, you can conclude uh, for all n and n p of n holds. So what we have correspondingly in the elimination rule for uh, the natural numbers. So what this is going to provide for us is this is something that will prove or inhabit really uh, one of these dependent function types. So the, the product type, the dependent function type, that's the type theoretic analog of the universal quantifier. So what we're gonna get out of this function, the codomain supplies a term uh, that is a function that would take an arbitrary n and n and produce a term of type p of n. See, that's for an arbitrary n is inhabiting the type p of n or proving whatever uh, predicate is encoded by this type p of n. And it's saying that to prove p and n, so in other words, to construct a term of this type, it suffices to construct a term here and a term here. So the term here we can think of as a proof of p of zero or an inhabitant of the type p of zero. And uh, the term here is an uh, inhabitant of this dependent function type for an arbitrary k. And the term of type p of k, it produces a term of type p of the successor of k. And uh, once more, there are computation rules that I have mostly been ignoring, but here it's exactly says that this function p is defined recursively from p naught and p s. Um, so this elimination rule can be thought of just as a constructive analog of the principle of mathematical induction. In other words, it's the principle of mathematical recursion that uh, gives us a recursively defined function. Yes. So can we ask you to this so I, the question was about uh, uh, axiom schema in ZFC. I mean, this is quantified over all type families, like the principle of mathematical induction is quantified over all predicates. Um, so, so yes, I, uh, I think so. Um, one other thing I want to note by point of comparison is two of the piano postulates are missing. So we have not assumed that zero is not a successor or that the successor function is injective. And the reason is that the, both are provable. So there's some additional strength in this replacing a type family or a predicate by a type family. And um, those proofs are super cool. I'd love to share them with you if you want to ask me about it afterwards. Okay, uh, so that is dependent type theory. Um, maybe I'll see if there are questions briefly before continuing. <laughs> 
I would have asked about those proofs, but you said ask at the end, so I'd ask at the end. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a longer story. I'm sorry to say, okay, um, um, but maybe I'll I'll mention um, this will also appear at the end, um, but. Uh, there's a forthcoming book on homotopy type theory, which is where we're going, uh, by Egbert Rilke, which, uh, like this presentation, starts by talking about dependent type theory before bringing in any more exotic aspects, and the proofs in there are very nice. Okay, great. So there's one aspect of traditional foundations that I have not addressed yet, and this is the equality relation. And that aspect is also encoded into this alternate formal system called dependent type theory. Um, but it's, uh, it's very interesting. So the, the aspects that I've discussed previously, um, you know, these dependent function types, dependent sum types are um, admittedly totally unfamiliar if you're seeing them for the first time, but they're also very directly analog analogous to, you know, traditional ways of thinking about universal quantification and existential quantification. Uh, I don't feel the same way about the identity types. I find these rules much less intuitive, but they're much more interesting for that reason. And uh, they were uh, discovered in the 1970s by Per Martin Luff and have only come to be fully understood in the last few decades. So let me just tell you what they are. Okay, so, um, so firstly, uh, the identity type exists whenever you're given a type A and then two terms, X and Y, that belong to the same type. So one of the rules that are played by types in uh, dependent type theory is they encode the statements of propositions. So what this is saying, the, just the mere existence of this identity type, which is the thing that I've written there, X equals Y sub script A in red, that's the syntax for the identity type. The existence of that type is saying essentially it's mathematically meaningful to wonder whether X and Y can be identified whenever X and Y are two terms of the same type. Now, it might be true or it might be false, um, but it's a meaningful question to ask, where it is not meaningful to ask whether X can be identified with Y if X and Y belong to two different types. So there's not an identity type for that, but there is an identity type whenever X and Y belong to the same type. So you can ask whether three is equal to four for three and four, two terms of type natural numbers. Uh, you cannot ask whether four is equal to square root of two for four a natural number and square root of two a rational number, or maybe I should say the klein four group is equal to the square root of two. That's not a meaningful thing to ask because those are two terms of different types. Okay, so the introduction rule then gives us terms inside identity types. And uh, again, the exist this, the when you write down the type, you're not asserting that it has any terms. So um, the introduction rule is inhabiting the identity type x equals x for any x. So this is saying that x equals x is always true. This introduction rule is asserting the truth of reflexivity for any x in, in A, any term x of type A. It is the case that x is equal to x, and refl x is the name of a proof of that. It's a term inhabiting the identity type, therefore exhibiting the truth of that statement. OK, so the elimination rule is the one that is uh, very clever and not so intuitive, but it's very, very closely in analogy with uh, the induction principle, or really the recursion principle for the natural numbers that we saw previously. So I'll go back and look at that in a moment. Um, both the natural numbers type and identity types are what's called inductive types, which means that there's a standard form for their elimination rules defined in terms of their introduction rules. So let's go back uh, to the elimination rule for the natural numbers type. This is essentially a constructive form of the principle of mathematical induction. What it was is it says that uh, it's providing a function that takes uh, some inputs and as an output um, produces a term in the dependent function type for some type family over the natural numbers in this case. And it says to inhabit this, to prove for all n and n that P of n holds, it suffices to consider two cases, uh, two cases corresponding to the two uh, constructors or in a, the two introduction rules for the natural numbers. So this one is exactly the same. So here, we're considering an arbitrary type family P over the identity type, which in this case means over a pair of terms of type A and a proof P that identifies the X with the Y, so an inhabitant of that identity type. And so this capital P is some type family that can be built out of that information. We'll see examples of this momentarily. So using an X and a Y and potentially an identification between them, we can state some mathematical result. So to prove universally that for all x, y, and a, and all identifications between them that p, x, y, p holds, 
it suffices to prove just a special case of that theorem. So it suffices to find a term here. All you have to check is in the case where y is literally x, and that proof is the reflexivity proof, the trivial proof. So this is the elimination rule for the identity type, and it's uh, magic, So, as we will soon discover. OK, so the identity type is a bit mysterious. And uh, here's an interesting question that you can ask. So firstly, these identity types can be iterated. So if I have a term x, y of type A, two terms of type A, and then two terms in the identity type that identify x with y, so p and q are two different proofs that x is equal to y. So whenever I have two terms belonging to the same type, I'm entitled to form their identity type. So I can form this type that is asking for an identification between P and Q as terms of the type X equals Y A. And there's a question, is that type inhabited? Is there always a term in there? Um, so in other words, are identity proofs unique? And uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, uh, so my understanding of the history is uh, that there were attempts to prove this for a few decades. Um, but it turns out it's, it's not provable from the axioms of Martin Luff dependent type theory. And the reason is uh, they actually equip these identity types with a much, much richer, higher dimensional structure. So it was proven that uh, there is not necessarily a term in that type by finding a, the construction of a model in uh, groupoids in which uh, the type A is interpreted as a groupoid, the X and Y are interpreted as objects in the groupoid, the P and Q are interpreted as then isomorphisms between X and Y as objects, and if you can certainly have uh, multiple distinct isomorphisms between a common pair of objects, and that uh, refuted the necessity of a term here. Um, but now... <laughs> yes. Yeah, so they constructed a model, that's right. Um, well, and... Uh, so there's different meanings of this term form depending on uh, sort of where this model lives. So it's, it, it could be in the syntax of type theory. Um, there's also different meanings of the term infinity groupoid that are defined in different ways by the authors. But um, anyway, uh, the idea um, is that uh, if I have an arbitrary type A, I can collect, collect together its terms and refer to them as the objects. I can collect together its identifications and refer to them as pet. So it's infinity groupoid is a synonym for a homotopy type, or so it's a, like a topological space up to homotopy. So imagine that I'm constructing a space uh, where the, the terms are the objects of the space. The identifications between the terms are the paths in the space. These terms of these iterated identity types, these higher identifications are now paths between paths, also known as homotopies. Those are the two-dimensional morphisms. And of course, this continues. If I had multiple terms in here, then I could form a higher identity type and look for homotopies there. Uh, so that continues all the way up. Um, that's giving the structure of something that you might call a globular set. And what makes it into an infinity groupoid is that we have this categorical structure as well. So the existence of these reflexivity terms, which we now might interpret as constant paths, uh, you know, serve as the identity morphisms here. Uh, in a groupoid, having a one morphism from x to y implies that you also have a one morphism from y to x, which can be thought of as the inverse of the morphism or a, a proof of symmetry. If uh, the function that takes this term to this term is proving an implication that if x is equal to y, then y is also equal to x. So that was not assumed in part of the rules of the identity type because it's provable. And similarly, we have transitivity or concatenation. So if I have a term p, of uh, that identifies x with y and a term q that identifies y with z, then I can construct a term that identifies x with z. And all of this structure is proven using this very powerful elimination rule for the identity type. We'll see an example of that on the next slide. Um, and of course, this is not at all the definition of an infinity groupoid. I need these sorts of categorical structures to exist at all levels, not just for the paths, but for the paths between paths and the paths between paths between paths, et cetera. And I need a lot of higher coherences, I, you know, as, associativity of composition, uh, some coherence between the associativities, and so on and so forth. And again, all of this structure can be generated automatically from this elimination rule. <laughs>
And so this is a very, I mean, originally this dependent type theory was thought of as an analog of set theory, really a constructive analog of set theory, and instead it uh, brings to life this higher structure. When was this theorem proven, right? Uh, sorry. Um, when was, so hoffman Stryker was 1995. Uh, so there was the, these homotopical ideas in dependent type theory were discovered independently in, by Aude Warren and Vladimir Brovatsky in the mid 2000s. Um, and uh, this, these results about the infinity groupoid structure are like 2008-ish, 2009, something like that. Um, yeah, so, great. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, this is giving us a new perspective, I suppose, on what this elimination rule for the identity type was actually doing. So I've just written it here, again, so we can see it. It's a strategy for proving uh, these universally quantified statements for all x, y, and a, for all proofs that x is equal to y, then some type built from that information is inhabited. To prove a statement like that, it suffices only to check it in the case where y and x are equal and the path is the constant path, the reflexivity. Um, so this is now colloquially sometimes called path induction because we think about this as uh, sort of mapping out of a path space. Um, and it connects back to one of the axioms for equality in first order logic. So the, the rules that characterize equality in the traditional foundations of mathematics are firstly reflexivity, so that for all x, x equals x is true. And secondly, something called indiscernibility of identicals after Leibniz, which says that x equals y implies for all predicates p, p of x is true if and only if p of y is true. So that's meant to be the biconditional. And we can prove that similarly in dependent type theory using this elimination rule for the identity type. So I'll do that for you now. So the statement, again, I'm, it's, I'm actually proving, I suppose, a structural generalization of this. I'm replacing the predicate by an arbitrary family of types. So given a family of types over A, uh, then for any terms x, y of type A, and any proof P that x is equal to y, or path from x to y, or identification between x and y, then there is this transport function that would take a term in the fiber over x and produce a term in the fiber over y. So let's prove that. So what are we trying to prove? So this, this transport function uh, will depend on x and y and also on this p. So I can think about this as a term in this dependent function type. Given an x, given a y, given a little p, then I have a function from p of x to p of y. So that's the transport function. I'm looking to define this term. But this term belongs to one of these types the form on the right of the elimination rule for the identity type. And what that elimination rule says is to inhabit a type like this, a uh, product over x, y, product over paths, and then something or other, it suffices to construct a term in the special case where my y is equal to x and the p disappears because it's just reflexivity. And so then this type family, when I plug in substitute x for y, now my goal is just to take an arbitrary x an arbitrary term of type p of x and return a term of type p of x. And I can write down a function that does that. I take my x, I take my term q of type p of x, and I return q. So uh, <laughs> this path lifting function is defined by path induction from the identity function. And that seems sort of magically trivial. And that's how uh, the proofs of all of the aspects of the infinity group word structure proceed as well. So uh, it's not just the case that I have a function from the type P of X to the type P of Y. I actually have an equivalence between types. I haven't defined an equivalence of types for you, but I'm just mentioning that as well. And the proof is exactly the same by path induction. To construct an equivalence for all X, Y, and P, it suffices to do so in the case that Y is X and P is Ruffle, in which case I'm looking for an equivalence between P of X and P of X. And I take the identity equivalence, easy enough. Great. So this is the modern, or this is, I guess, the homotopy type theoretic interpretation of the rules in this dependent type system from the 1970s. You know, previously, there was this uh, Curry-Howard interpretation where uh, these type theory is thought of as being analogous simultaneously to set theory and logic. So we have, uh, you know, product of sets, we have and the logical operation of and, 
we have these type families, which are like predicates or families of sets. But now we have a new interpretation. So a type family is thought of as a vibration. Uh, vibrations are a notion from topology that are characterized by a path lifting property, which was exactly what we saw with this transport function or this indiscernibility of identicals. Uh, originally, again, these identity types were thought of as just being the equality relation. But now we have a richer perspective on identity types. We think of them as analogous to path spaces. And um, sure enough, there are constant paths when you have between a term and itself, but there are also loops or paths between terms that are distinct. Uh, and um, this homotopy interpretation was uh, sort of discovered independently uh, in the first decade of the aughts by Audi Warren and Wojewatski, and has been further justified by a model of uh, types as con complexes, which are a particular sort of simplicial set, uh, and type families as con vibrations. And so what that means is that um, uh, so constructing a model of a type theory is a way of comparing this formal system with traditional set-based mathematics, um, you know, to check relatively consistency, for instance. Okay. So once, though, we have this homotopy type theory information, um, we can read intuitions back the other way. So uh, there's a lot of constructions in topology that we can now interpret in the type theory. And the first one of these is this notion of a contractible type. So this was a definition proposed by, by Wojewatski. So we're gonna define a type to be contract. If we're thinking of a type now as something like a homotopy type or an infinity group void, it makes sense to wonder whether it's contractible. So uh, this type is contra A is a type that is asking the question, is A contractible? If you have a term of that type, then you have a proof that it is in fact contractible. And what is that type? So the way I will read it is it says there exists some A and A so that for all X and A, A is identifiable with X, A is equal to X. Why do but people I'm never write that? You've, you, you've just said something that would really help me if, if, someone, if somehow it was written that way. Uh, so would you prefer, are you saying I should use the symbol backwards there exists and yeah, for all? I mean, in the hot book, it's written in exactly the same way. And it took me ages to understand it because I was thinking, is that a sum and a product? What's going on? But what you've said explains it really well. Well, I, I think it's supposed to be both this and also a sum and a product. Um, uh, because... Uh, you know, because the, the, the type is contra, well, not actually not for this particular instance, but in general, a type might have more than one term. And uh, anyway, but, I, uh, I love I love the way you said it. Great. <laughs> Thank the you. way you've written it scares me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll take, I'm, I appreciate that note, so thank you. Um, I mean, there's, there's a subtle difference between uh, the existential quantifier and this uh, dependent sum, which is the sigma involving constructivity, which I'll discuss. Oh, of, so you really can't, you can't write it the way I was trying to encourage you to write it. Is that what you're saying? Well, so sometimes the notation of the exists, the backwards E is used for the propositional truncation. So the, the thing that does not carry the information of a particular term here. Well, in, fa in fact, let me try and explain that right now. So let's suppose I have a term in this type. So I've asserted that such a term proves that A is contractible. So what information does that give us? So um, by the elimination rule for the sigma types, that's the one that says how you can use a term inside a sigma type, that such a term would project to give us a term of type A called the center of contraction. And then also a term in this type where I've substituted this C for the little a up there. And that we think of as a contracting homotopy. This is a function that for each X and A produces a path from C to X. In the homotopy interpretation, it does so continuously. So this is why this is a proof of contractibility as, a, as opposed to proof of path connectedness. And a thing that uh, is a bit different in a way the way these sigma types behave and the way existential quantification works in traditional non-constructive mathematics is we do get an explicit term of type A. So uh, this is in a constructive form of existence where a term of the sigma type provides the witness uh, and doesn't just prove abstractly that something exists. Um, so that's a bit of a difference. Um, but there's, this is the point that I want to make that I'm going to use later. Uh, so if A is a contractible type, so in other words, if you do have a term in this type that's asking the question, is A contractible, 
And then I have two other terms of type A. This information guarantees that there is a term P that identifies X with Y. This can be understood as the concatenation of the reversal of the homotopy from X to C and from C to Y, for instance. Uh, and that means then that X and Y are indiscernible. So we've seen previously that as soon as I have a path from X to Y or a proof identifying them, then for any type families over this data, uh, there's an equivalence there. Um, so thus, the formal system treats contractible types as if they have a single term. They do not literally have a single term. It's, uh, they have however many terms they have, but any uh, two terms could be substituted for one another. So it's sort of as if they were singletons. Um, okay, and then these contractible types are the bottom of a hierarchy of types, which is also due to Voivodsky, defined as, as follows. So we'll say that a type is a proposition if for any two terms, X and Y, the identity type is contractible. So sort of intuitively, the way you think about this is there's two ways that this condition could be satisfied. If A has no terms, then it's vacuously satisfied. And if A does have a term, then A has to be a contractible type. Um, so these are, these are the propositions. In this case, there's no, uh, there's no distinction between any two terms because there's this contractible type of identifications between them. So that's sort of the true proposition. And the false one is when there are no inhabitants. And then similarly, we'll define a set type to be a set or a zero type if its identity types are propositions. So if uh, the question of whether any two terms agree is a yes or no question, and then there's no reason to stop there. So one types are those whose identity types are sets, two types are those whose identity types are one types, and so on all the way up. So a way to think about this is, is within the system of dependent type theory, we have a logic layer and a uh, set theory later. Right now, they behave more like constructive mathematics than classical ones, but you could add classical axioms, law of excluded middle axiom of choice, sort of recover uh, traditional mathematics within those layers, but then these are augmented by these layers for higher structures. And then, uh, I guess, sorry, I guess I wrote that. Um, and let's, but now there's interesting things going on in the higher layers, and I'm going to conclude this section by telling you a little bit about that. So um, homotopy type theory suggests definitions of when uh, two types are equivalent or when a map between types is an equivalence, and I'll read it for you. So this type whose terms would provide the data of an equivalence between A and B is as follows. It says that there exists some function f from A to B, and then there exists a function g from B to A, together with a term in this pi type that's a homotopy comparing the composite g of f and the identity. And also there exists a function h from b to a together with a homotopy comparing the composite f composed h to the identity. Okay, so this is the data that you would get from a proof that a is equivalent to b. It's a little strange that this type is being defined in this way because using this data of these homotopies alpha and beta, you can define a homotopy from g to h. So in this type I've asked for a left inverse and a right inverse to my f rather than a two-sided inverse. And there's an interesting reason for that. You might instead consider the simpler type whose data would comprise of a function g from b to a and then homotopies witnessing that it's both a left and a right inverse. But this type here is not a proposition in the sense defined on the previous slide. So it's possible for certain a's and b's to have two different terms of this type that cannot be identified. Uh, and that's the sort of question that uh, becomes visible in this formal system. So there's a distinction between types that are logically equivalent, meaning there's functions from one to the other and the other to one, and genuinely equivalent, meaning they're equivalent in the sense of higher structures. So this type and the type under the sigma above are logically equivalent, but not genu genuinely equivalent. Um, so uh, that's something I find very interesting. <laughs> Okay, so what I've described so far is really this formal system of dependent type theory developed by Martin Liff in the 1970s, together with this new homotopy interpretation, which is uh, giving some new perspectives on this classical system. Um, what is referred to as homotopy type theory or univalent foundations is the addition of an additional axiom into the system, which I'll tell you about now. And uh, this axiom is asking about identifications between types themselves. So. In traditional dependent type theory, there's also a universe of small types. So I can think of types as being terms in the universe. In particular, then I have a type 
of identifications between A and B. So these are paths from A to B in the universe. That's giving some notion of sameness between the types A and B. And you might ask how that compares with this notion of equivalence of types that we've just defined. Um, so there's a comparison map in one direction that's uh, defined by this elimination rule for the identity type that sends the constant path to the identity equivalence. And the univalence axiom is asserting that that map is an equivalence. So in other words, equivalences can, between types can be converted into paths in the universe types. The slogan is identity is equivalent to equivalence. This uh, axiom is justified by Vyvatsky's simplicial set-based model, so it's consistent to assume this axiom, and it has a lot of really wonderful consequences for the formal system. So one of my favorites is something called the structure identity principle, um, which uh, specializes to statements. So we saw at the very beginning there's a type of groups. You could have multiple terms in the type of groups, and then you have an identity type between them. And the structure identity principle characterizes the identity type, and it says it's equivalent to the type of group isomorphisms. And similarly for rings and monoids, any other set-based structure, and also for higher structures as well. So for univalent categories, it'll, the identity type will specialize to equivalences of categories and so on and so forth. So this uniform notion of identity type does not just capture traditional equality, but really the richer notion of sameness that mathematicians use intuitively. Um, there's also a co consequence called function extensionality, which I'll mention for folks who know what that is. Um, but the main point is kind of this indiscernibility of identicals business. So what univalence allows us to do is convert an equivalence between types, which is a thing that you would prove, into an identification, so a, a path in the universe. And the whole formal system necessarily respects these identifications. So univalence makes the whole formal system equivalence invariant. And again, it's uh, allowing us to transfer information. So if I had had more room, I would have uh, put a term here that's indicating there's an explicit transport function that's giving the equivalence between P of X and P of Y. And so this uh, sort of justifies the common mathematical practice of transporting results proven about one object to any other object that is equivalent to it. So you can use one presentation of your ring to, I don't know, compute the order of some element or whatever. And then that's of course true for the, another presentation of that ring as well. Great, okay, so. Let me briefly conclude, I guess, and then we'll uh, um, come back for a discussion. So my other uh, attraction to this foundation system has to do with my research. So I apologize, I'm gonna say something about infinity categories, but only very briefly. So uh, there's this uh, quote by Yuri Manin, which does not describe, uh, I think, the worldview of all mathematicians, but does describe the worldview of mathematicians within my own mathematical world, which uh, is maybe concerning higher structures. Um, so, um, you know, so, sort of something about uh, the homotopical picture of the world, uh, where uh, sets now correspond to the connected components of some space, something like this. Okay, um, so in, in my work, I work on something called infinity categories, which are an analog of ordinary one-dimensional categories, essentially where we've replaced all of the sets by infinity groupoids or homotopy types. So an ordinary category has a set of objects, an infinity category has an infinity groupoid of objects. Ordinary categories have HOM sets of morphisms, infinity categories have these infinity groupoidal mapping spaces. But what makes this sort of particularly difficult to reason about is, you know, in an ordinary category, you have a composition function that, uh, you know, binary, partially defined binary function that takes in two arrows and spits out the composite for Infinity categories, that's morphism between infinity groupoids, but it's, that's not really a function in a traditional sense because an infinity groupoid is like a homotopy type, and homotopy types don't really have underlying sets of points. You know, the question, you know, how many points does your contractible space have? I mean, I don't know, one uncountably infinitely many, it's, you know, it's kind of an interesting situation. So, um, so it's quite difficult to uh, model or sort of rigorously define and prove theorems about infinity categories in set theory just because there aren't a whole lot of sets involved. So um, there are different presentations of the theory of infinity categories that go by various names, quasi-categories and complete Siegel spaces. And then the theory is developed analytically using one of the models. And there's these questions about how all this compares. And um, it's, it's all totally rigorous. I'm not making that point, but it's more complicated than I think would be ideal. So let me try and make this a little more 
concrete. So um, let's let X be a topological space. Um, so there's a construction that's called the total singular complex of X. This is also known as the fundamental infinity groupoid of X or the anima, it's kind of the soul of the space, the homotopy type. And uh, so this is some sort of infinity groupoid. The objects are the points of X. The morphisms are the paths of X. And composition of paths is witnessed by higher paths in the following sense. So if you imagine little x, y, and z are three points in a space, and f and g are paths between them, if I had any path from x to z and any homotopy inhabiting that triangle, then that would be a witness that k is a composite of g and f in the fundamental one groupoid, if you will. So the data of this k paired with that alpha is the composition data associated to g and f in the fundamental infinity groupoid. Okay, so in ordinary category theory, there's a unique composite of any morphisms, you know, the output of the composition function. In infinity category theory, this is an example of an infinity category, uh, the space of composites of two paths is instead contractible. So we have a uniqueness condition replaced by a contractibility condition. This is very uh, prototypical, this is just an example. Uh, and we can prove that quickly. So I'm going to define this space of composites to be a subspace of the mapping space from the two simplex into X, because the data of a composite is really this pair comprised of the path K together with the homotopy alpha that's inhabiting that triangle. But it's not this full mapping space, it's only the subspace comprised of continuous maps from here to here that when I restrict to this horn-shaped boundary, uh, coincide with the path F followed by the path G. That what's, what is what makes it the space of composites of the path F to the path G. So this is the fiber, the pullback here. And to see that it's contractible, it would suffice to consider any sphere in here and extend it to a disk. So solve some lifting problem because uh, we're mapping into the pullback. It's equivalent to solve this lifting problem in the exterior rectangle. Uh, you can transpose across some two variable adjunction and that corresponds to extending some problem from this like trough into a uh, solid thing, prism, I guess. Uh, and um, the extension exists because that inclusion is a deformation retract. Okay, so, um, right. So the problem again is it's hard to give a definition of infinity categories in set theory because there are not a lot of sets in the data of an infinity category. Um, but, uh, Homotopy type theory is in some sense a synthetic theory of infinity <laughs> groupoids. So there's hope that it would be better, easier to give a definition of infinity category in homotopy type theory. So the sense in which in homotopy type theory is a synthetic theory of infinity groupoids is we saw that each type has this family of identity types whose terms are called the paths and then we have higher paths and so on. So um, together with Mike Schulman, um, we've extended this formal system. So we've uh, introduced a simplicial layer and some new type forming operations into the dependent type theory. And a result of that extension is each type that also has this family of HOM types whose terms we call arrows. So the terms of the identity types are the paths, the terms of the HOM types are arrows. So there's work done in setting up this formal system, but inside this formal system, we can actually define what an infinity category is in much more natural language. So there are two axioms. The first says that if I have a composable pair of arrows, there is a unique composite. And what I mean by uniqueness is that the moduli space of such composites is contractible. That's what it gets interpreted in when we interpret this back in set theory. But within the formal system, it really does behave as if there is a unique composite. So we recover this composition function that exists for one categories, but doesn't really exist for infinity categories, at least in traditional foundations. Um, and then there's a second condition, which is the univalence or completeness condition for people who know something about this. So I, I strongly believe in this law of conservation of work that Akshay mentioned in the last talk. And the work goes into setting up the formal system. But once you're in the formal system, uh, you can do things like prove the innate lemma by taking the one categorical proof and writing it down again. And in fact, you get some steps for free because the, the naturality is sort of taken care of somehow. So um, anyway, uh, so that's another thing that interests me. Okay, so uh, final, I should, I'm not at all an expert on computer proof assistance, but I should say a little something about that because I know that's of interest to folks in the audience. So um, 
you know, part of what motivated Wojewatski to develop univalent foundations is he wanted a usable computer proof assistant so he could do his work. He was not trusting the community to uh, quickly catch mistakes in his work, and so he wanted to catch them himself by using a computer proof assistant. And to do so, he wanted to narrow the gap between the mathematical intuitions that he had and what is required to formalize the computer proof assistant. Since computers speak the language of dependent type theory, I think that drew him to dependent type theory. And then his work on higher structures uh, led him to univalence and so on. Um, we've heard a lot about computer proof assistants here, and unfortunately, they are unsuitable. They're lean, the most popular one, is unsuitable in its current form. Uh, for homotopy type theory, because in lean, the identity types are propositions, which makes all types into sets, and the assertion that all types are sets is incompatible with univalence. So that's sad for us. Uh, we have to use other proof assistants. So an old version of lean, you could kind of turn off that. Uh, Agda, similarly, you can sort of turn off the all types or sets axiom and, and work with that. There's something called Agda uh, from Koch as well. Um, there's a sense in which our proof assistants are a lot less fancy in terms of you know, the tactics and the things that really improve the user experience. And the reason is that the community is doing a lot of work still meta-theoretically, um, figuring out exactly what sort of formal system we want, what the semantics of this formal system is. Um, so, um, Nevertheless, there was a breakthrough this summer that's fun that I will conclude by telling you about. So this stemmed from a PhD thesis of Guillaume Brunnery in 2016 that gave a proof in homotopy type theory of the following. So this is a sigma type uh, for Kevin. There, so there exists a, a natural number, or I guess an integer that exists in N and Z, so that the fourth homotopy group of the three sphere Z mod NZ. So he gave a constructive proof of this in homotopy type theory using a lot of uh, theory from what's called synthetic homotopy theory. And the reason I'm calling this Synthetic homotopy theory is really this, this formal system is a constructive system, so you can't just take the classical proof and formalize it. This often required devising new proofs and new constructions of you know, the existence of the long exact sequence of homotopy groups of a vibration and so on and so forth. Um, it might feel frustrating to have to reprove classical theorems, but in fact what's being done is we're proving generalizations of theorems. So, uh, Mike Schulman has demonstrated that homotopy type theory can be interpreted in an arbitrary infinity topos. So this can be thought of as a generalization of homotopy theory from spaces to other similar infinity topoi. Okay, so I mean, Guillaume then asked this natural question. Um, so we have a constructive proof that uh, produces a term of a, a sigma type. You should be able to project and figure out what the n is from the constructive proof. So which cyclic group is this homotopy group of spheres? You should just be able to kind of run the computer and figure that out. Uh, and so this was a challenge to the community, but, but there was an issue sort of right away. So dependent type theory without univalence is a foundation for constructive mathematics. That system has these properties, decidable check, type checking, normalization, canonicity, which means in particular, like a term of type natural numbers is explicitly a successor of a successor of a successor of a successor of zero. It corresponds to an actual numeral, but if your proof called the univalence axiom, then you're using the data of an inexplicit inverse equivalence to this map from the identity type to the type of equivalences. So you can't sort of reduce beyond that point. Your uh, computation gets stuck there. So now I'm talking about this computational layer independent type theory that I've been suppressing. Um, so in the last decade, um, there have been constructive proofs of univalence so constructing an explicit inverse equivalence to this map in various cubical variants of homotopy type theory. So these are uh, sort of new versions of dependent type theory that have this sort of cubical layer. The interval is a primitive notion, and we're taking seriously the idea that uh, identifications are paths. And um, here's some of the folks involved in those. And there have been parallel developments of these computer cubical proof assistants that recover these computational properties of uh, normalization and uh, canonicity, but attempts to compute the Brunery number uh, ran out of memory until this summer. So a PhD student, Axel Lundström, uh, simplified Guillaume's original proof and then was able to run one of these uh, computer proof assistants like a computer program to take this constructive proof that there exists an N and tell us what that N was. And uh, we got the answer negative two. We were expecting two, but I mean, negative two is, of course, also Z mod negative two Z is the same as Z mod two Z, so it's okay. 
Um, all right, that's it. Uh, thanks very much. Here are some references.